We're at, in 2 Peter right now, this is, this is Peter's second letter that we know about, and he's writing to uh, believers. It's uh, on top of the last one he wrote. And this is how I want to start this morning. Is faith baseless? Is faith baseless? Like, for instance, when someone says this, well, I guess I'll just have to take it on faith. When they're saying that, they're saying, there's no basis for what I'm believing. There's no facts behind it. So I'll just take it on faith because faith, faith is baseless. Is that true from a biblical definition? Oh, that's how it's colloquially used. Or for instance, in this context, with, with Mr. Scientist. Mr. Scientist will say, I have facts, so I don't need faith. And that's act, this is a very common thing that's said these days. There's the, they'll say there's the world of facts, which is, for them, reality. And then there's the world of faith, which is myth, right? Is that true? Well, not exactly, but this, this is how they'll go on. They'll say something like this. Ignorant people who cannot handle science must resort to God to explain what they are incapable of understanding. That's a classic scientific mindset to this very day, to this very day. I would argue very strongly about the fact that the more that we understand the way this place is made, the more we really see God's hand in it. And that's very true, especially when you get to DNA and stuff like that, a whole bunch of things. But that's the classic idea, that the world of facts and the world of faith never touch. And so that's why I ask, is faith baseless? Is it built on something or is it not built on something? And just to tell you how phony this is, watch this this. Uh, this artificial conversation that I put together with them. All faith is really basis. It has a basis. For instance, there's Mr. Scientist again, and I ask him, so, did the universe begin with the Big Bang? And he'll say, well, yes, it did. And then I'll say, well, then have you observed a Big Bang in your laboratory? <laughs> and he'll say, well, no, that's impossible. In fact, that's very dangerous, so don't try that at home. <laughs> that's impossible. And I'll say, well, then... Then, you do, then, then why do you believe in the Big Bang at all? He'll say, well, other observations that support your belief, yes, they form the basis for what I cannot observe directly. And then I jump and say, then you have faith in the Big Bang. And he says, hey, you're some kind of religious nut. <laughs> but that really is what faith is. It starts on a basis of fact, and it extends its understanding. That's what faith is. And it's based on a good understanding of fact that allows faith to expect something that's, that's, that you can't directly see. So all faith really has a basis. And faith is an extension of what you know, and what you know forms that basis. Now, I want to make this clear because we're going to use this in a second to talk about what, what Peter talked about last week. But that's the whole deal. Faith and facts ought to necessarily touch. They're not two different worlds. My faith in someone, for instance, that I ask them to do something for me or they're going to do something for me. My faith, my, my, what I can see about what's going to happen, my confidence in that, that's faith, is based on what I know that person to be. And that's just a very, so faith, I always think of faith as an extension from what you know. Um, if someone's word is good because every time they say they'll do something, they do it, then I have faith they will do it based on their word. And this is very clearly how faith is used in the Bible because we have confidence in God's word. He's true to his word. So that's what we're saying. If there was no demonstrated track record that God's word was trustworthy, that he wasn't faithful, we would absolutely have no reason to have faith. It would be just, well, I guess I just have to take it on faith because I have no facts. But that's not biblical faith, okay? So what's your base, what is your faith based upon? So I want you to think about this for a second. Your faith is based upon what is its foundation? Is it uh, what you want to be true or, or what you hope to be true? Oh, I hope, I hope, I please, please, please. Actually, a lot of people's faith is based on that, what they want to be true. Or C, is it what everyone else says is true? That is, if everyone else believes it, it must be true, so I'm going to do go with them. Everyone around me, everyone I know believes it, so it must be true. Or D, is it what mystics say is true? Or maybe it's what the internet says is true? <laughs> or worse yet, what Joel Osteen says is true? <laughs> Sorry, Joel. So really, what do you base it on? Because you, ha you have expectations about what will happen in the future, about the nature of things that are unseen in the spiritual room, and you have some basis to say, I have faith that it's like this. You remember the beginning of Hebrews chapter 11? Faith is the evidence of things unseen, is what he's saying. So really, faith is telling you about something that you can't see yet, but you have some basis for why to expect that. That's faith. That's faith. So what do we base our faith on? Well, you know what? I'm going to leave you in suspense and answer that with the rest of today's passage. <laughs> and let me just, while you're thinking about that, let me just do a quick 
graphical summary of last week. You ready? Here we go. Last week was really evidence of your faith. They were these graces. There were these evidences that worked their way out in the outside of your life, which interestingly enough, you can take part in influencing bringing out. But there's something that God builds in you. So here's my graphical way of talking about it. He said in, in 2 Peter 1, he said, if these qualities are yours and they're increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful. So there's these qualities, and we went through that list of qualities that are there and they're increasing and they make you useful. He goes on two verses later and says... Make certain about his calling and choosing you, that he already has done that. For as long as you practice these things, you'll never stumble. So there was this something about the fact that if these things in your life, if these things are evidenced in your life, it's not how you earn salvation. They are necessary evidences of your having salvation. That's what he's saying right here. And to, to kind of press it home, we have to go to grape land. So here's a grape, a grapevine right here. And the grape one day wakes up and says, how do I know that I'm good with God? I mean, where am I with God? How do I know? Well, we say back to him, are you green? Uh, yes, I'm green. Are you growing? Yes, yes, I'm growing. Are you making grapes? Absolutely, I'm making grapes. Well, all that comes from your rootstock. My rootstock? Yeah, Jesus. So I'm not a weed? <laughs> not if you're making Jesus grapes. That was last week's evidences. Not if you're making Jesus grapes. Oh, right. So the whole point of that silly interaction is this, 2 Peter 1.3. His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So we looked last week at those things that come out of our life that he's granted already. If those things are coming out of your life, you can be sure of your calling from him, sure of your election from him, because he is working out in you godliness. If that's, if that's happening, he's saying if they're there, and they're growing just like grapes on a grapevine, well, then you're attached to the Savior. That's, that's all he's saying. These things are evidences. And interestingly, like I said before, you can participate in the program of drawing these evidences out in your life. That's all he's saying. If they're there and they're growing, then you're his because he wouldn't be investing in you and changing you if you weren't his. Am I a grapevine? Do you make grapes? Yes. There is the evidence of being hooked into the vine. John 15, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you abide in me and I in you, you make grapes. And these are Jesus grapes. So that's what I'm saying. There's a godliness of what comes out of our lives that does not come from you. You can participate in helping and in partnership, but God's the one who does it because he gives you everything pertaining to life and godliness. So that was last week. It was really the evidence of my faith is what he's constantly doing in me today today and how he's changing me and how I'm growing. Things are happening to me actually somewhat against my will in some cases, but other times with my participation. So this is that, that's in the, in the huge religious world. If you ever hear the word sanctification, that's what sanctification is. It's the gradual, evident producing of Jesus grapes in your life that look like Jesus. And he said also in that part, he says you'll be fruitful and you'll be usable. You won't be unemployed for the kingdom because as fruit collects on your vines, people will say, that's unusual. I don't see many grapevines around here. How, where does that come from? And you look to your root and you say, Jesus. That's how he, that's how he glorifies. So that was last week, evidence of our faith. Okay, so now I'll put you out of your misery. What's your faith based on? Is it wishful thinking? Is it everyone else does it? Is it Joel Osteen? <laughs> let's find out what it's based on because this is exactly that's the question he wants to answer today in the end of chapter one of, of second peter w what is it based on so did you come to an idea did you trace back what yours is based on and just kind of hold that in your head and we'll see if your answer agrees with peter's because your faith is based on something it's not just a, well i guess i have to take that on faith no it's based on something so let's see here we go chapter one verse 16 Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We didn't, we didn't follow cleverly devised tales. In the Greek, it's the word that we get the word mythologies from. He says, I didn't bring you a myth. Uh, very cleverly created myths. Something that are so cleverly created that everyone hears the story of this myth and they go, Oh! That must be true. No, that's the cleverly device. He said, I'm just telling you what, what we saw. 
what was made known to us. This is our personal experience, is what he's saying. So what I've told you about this Jesus isn't something that we just made up this story because we can create this religion and we'll get all this money because of it, and it's just very clever and people will fall for it. However, in our present day, we know that, we know that there are some very cleverly devised tales that are the foundation of a lot of cults and false religions, and they are very attractive. One of the most predominant one is this theme of... of um, getting riches, basically, this prosperity gospel. And, and many preachers of this false religion will say, if you just do what we're doing and believe what we're saying, then inevitably you'll get rich because after all, God loves you and he wants to make you rich, right? And to, you know, to tickle the ears and go, ah, sure. And I would say 80, 90% of all the false religions today somehow work on that line. God loves you. He owes you riches. You just need to follow us and we'll show you how that's all possible. If you watch, if you watch televangelists on TV, they'll always say this. You need to send us money as a seed that you plant in the ground, your money, and then it'll blossom into a plant that has multifold on it and you'll get back hundreds or thousands of times back what you send to us today. The, you know, the address is send it today. Of course, in the end, the only person getting rich is the guy asking for the cash. Because they're not really preaching a true gospel. They're preaching something that tickles your ears. It's a cleverly devised myth that they know will be attractive. And so many people get sucked into it. So, so be careful about it. Peter says, we didn't make up one of these tales when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see Lord Jesus Christ, retranslate those words into the boss, Jesus, Messiah. Christ means Messiah. Lord means the boss, means the highest authority. So we, you know, we didn't make these things up when we told you about the power and the coming of this boss, Jesus, the Messiah. Okay, We didn't make these things up. The power, what he can do, what we saw him do, and especially this word coming is a great, it's not just the word coming, it's actually, it's a very, it's a very famous word in the New Testament, uh, parousia. And parousia means, is para that means to be alongside in the sea, which is to be. So it's him coming alongside. It's, it's more like in our English words, to come and visit. I'm going to come visit you. So you come and then you stay and you're alongside and you're close. That's what that is. So he's saying, we didn't make this up. This Jesus, who is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, whose name is Yeshua, Jesus, who also is the Old Testament fulfillment as Messiah, he has power and he came near alongside of us and he visited with us. That's what the coming means. That word, by the way, is going to become really important because that word gets used anytime the New Testament talks about the second coming of Jesus, the parousia. It's all through Matthew 24. It's in 1 Thessalonians 1 and 2 when he talks about the return of Jesus. So Jesus comes once, this first time in the first century, and he para, you know, uzia, he comes alongside near to us and he visits us. He actually lives with us. And then someday he parousias us again when he comes back a second time. So it's a very important word for Peter um, and also the other apostles. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. No Grimm's fairy tales cleverly devised to communicate a wonderful little, you know, moral of the story. And a lot of unbelievers think that the Bible is the creation of a bunch of men to come up with these cute little stories that give you these nice moral conclusions. And so they'll say, kind of, uh, kind of tolerantly, they'll say, well, I, I'm not against the Bible. It says nice things, and it has good stories in it. Well, they're thinking of it like Grimm's fairy tales, but that's not what it is at all. It's not, oops, go back. It's not Grimm's fairy tales. Even Peter, Paul, when he talks to Timothy, says, instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths, same word, and endless genealogies, which give rise to mere speculation. By the way, if you have a Mormon background, that genealogies might stick in your craw right there. <laughs> he says, don't do that. Because what does it result in? Endless speculation. A speculation is a guess at reality based on no facts. That's actually our culture's classic definition of faith, is a guess at things based on no facts. Well, that's what Paul says right here. All those things just end up bringing speculation. They don't really bring understanding of the way things really are. They don't. They just spawn speculation. So, so really, these fairy tales are not what we're talking about. We're talking about, Peter says, and I want to be very clear, he says, this is an eyewitness account 
I saw it with my own eyes. And just to prove it, he goes on. He says, for when he received honor, talking about Jesus, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What in the world is that? <laughs> well, he just told us that everything that, that he has relayed about Jesus is an eyewitness thing. And he says, let me tell you one of my eyewitness accounts. And if you're familiar with the Gospels, it's this account right here. So I'm going to go back up and look at it. It's in Matthew 17. It's also in Luke 9 and Mark 9. And a uh, great passage. He just goes on in the narrative. Matthew writes, six days later, Jesus took with him Peter. That's the same guy who's writing the letter today. Took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother. Led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. So Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll make three tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. It's surprising Peter survived this encounter. (laughs) It's kind of a stick your foot in your mouth kind of thing. Anyway, the passage goes on, uh, and he says... um, uh, and let me not go on. Let me just highlight this. His face shone like the sun, and his garments became as white as light. So whatever was going on on the top of this mountain, Jesus suddenly looked oh, way different. Yeah, just blazing white. It's crazy stuff. And if you look through the Bible to find out is there any similar cases where the Messiah, where Jesus looks like this, you, you find that there is. There's one in Revelation 1, the very beginning of Revelation 1, when John is actually starting to transcribe what he's seeing, he says, in the first person, John says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it's been made to glow in a furnace. You know, that bright white orangey. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And he says, I'm the first and I'm the last, borrowing a phrase from Isaiah, and the living one, and I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Any ambiguity who's speaking in the first person there? I was dead and I'm alive. And so this is Jesus. So here, here indeed, as John starts to transcribe for us revelation, and this voice is telling me, he turns and finds out that this is Jesus. Not because he recognizes him, because, oh my gosh, his face is white and but because he says, I'm the one who was dead and now I'm alive. However, John was one of those three guys on the mountain that day with Peter and James. And he saw Jesus just like this. So there's really no ambiguity in his mind. He could think back, yeah, there was that really freaky day where, you know, James and Peter and I went up on the mountain with Jesus and then boom, and the face was off. So it, he should have recognized. He probably did. So that's, that's exactly what we're talking about, this great... This great um, shining in that sense. So he goes on. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell down, uh, fell face down on the ground and were terrified. That's a good reaction. And Jesus came to them, touched them, and said, get up, don't be afraid. And lifting up their eyes, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. So this, this, this event is captured for us in the first three Gospels. For reasons we don't know, John never mentioned it in his, in his Gospel. Kind of an odd thing, because he was there at the time. Uh, but the first three Gospels mention this really clearly. And Peter is saying in his letter right now, I was there. So I'm not making these things up. I was there. And I saw something about Jesus that was radically different. I saw his majesty. I, I, saw, I saw transfiguring something just... I know that this guy, Jesus, isn't just a normal guy because i got to tell you what I saw on the mountain that day. But then he says, interestingly enough, it wasn't so much what I saw, it's what I heard. Because we heard this voice out of heaven saying, this is my son, I'm well pleased with him, listen to this guy. And Peter says, you know, I was there, so I'm not making this up, it just, this just happened to me, I was there. When Jesus sends the apostles off at the end of the, of the New Testament, he says that you'll be my witnesses. And a witness, that's a, that's a court of law phrase, a witness, even to this very day, it's illegal for a witness to tell something that's secondhand. Because if you'd say that in court, they say, hearsay. hearsay. Objection, Your Honor, that's hearsay. You can only tell what you personally experienced. And so Jesus says, I want you to tell what you personally experienced. And now he's writing Second Peter, and he says, this is what happened to me. I didn't make this up. So, so what I'm telling you about Jesus, Peter is saying, is not based on myth. 
It's not based on clever devised tales. I'm telling you what I saw and what I heard. John, when he writes his gospel, he says, not only it's what he saw and what he heard, but what he touched. I mean, this is what I experienced. This is what it's all about. So we go back, and he tells them, this is exactly what happened. By the way, as an aside, um, as an aside, uh, it turns out that in that passage in, in Matthew that we looked at, I'm going to go to the Mark passage real quick. Um, there's a, there's, a, a, there's a, a verse right before the transfiguration story, which is very important um, in, t- in terms of letting us understand what's going on. Uh, I should have looked this up earlier. Sorry, I'm looking really hard here. What's that? Mark 9. Mark, oh, I'm in 7. That would make it really hard. There we go, the transfiguration. Okay. Um, do you remember at the beginning of the Luke passage and also in these other passages, it says it was six days later? Um, well, in Mark 9, the six days later verse is verse 2, and he starts the transfiguration story. But verse 1, the six days after what? Well, and Jesus was saying to them, this is Mark 9, 1, and Jesus was saying to them, truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it's coming with power. A lot of critics of Jesus, non-believers will say, Jesus is a false prophet because he predicted that some of the men that were with him at the time would see Jesus coming in his power, that is the coming of his kingdom, and it never happened before they all died. So Jesus was a liar and he was a false prophet. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the top of the mountain. In all three of the Gospels, he's trying to tie together the fact that what they saw was exactly the fulfillment of what happened the verse before the transfiguration story. That is, they saw the kingdom of God coming in Jesus. So in a real sense, you say, well, wait, the kingdom didn't come that day. Yeah, I know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? I th- the best way to explain it, and, and this is where my science fiction nerdiness is going to pop out, in a way, what they saw was kind of a portal view into the future. They saw Jesus coming in glory, looking like he's described in Revelation, with, uh, with Moses and with Elijah. And they actually got a view across the centuries in time to when Jesus comes the second time. And he'll look radically different, radically different, because his majesty will show in that sense. So they actually saw forward into the future, which is why after they fell down on the ground on their faces and they're going, ah, we're terrified, Jesus lifts them up and says, that's okay, everything's fine now. And whoosh, it's all gone. So... That's the the fulfillment of seeing Jesus coming in his glory. So I just thought I'd stick that in there because a lot of critics say Jesus was a false prophet because his kingdom never came before these guys died. Well, it didn't, but they saw it. And that's all he promised. They saw it. Okay, let's push on. We ourselves heard this utterance. So this is an eyewitness account. He's saying it over and over again, and this is the the best one he can think to, to talk about, which is good because this is the place where unequivocally it's clear that the Father in heaven has endorsed who Jesus is because he heard a voice from heaven saying so. So it's it's the best case that that Peter can think about. Well, but look what he says. This is my beloved son. That's what I mean, but how come it's not in red then? Oh, I don't know. You know what I mean? Like whenever Jesus speaks, it's always in red. It's not in red on yours? Oh, that's interesting. It's It's the Father speaking. That's what it is. So maybe that's why, because they the only... Father speaks, they don't, and then they just put it like Jesus in heaven, body. Right. They put in red. Yeah, they'll put in red what Jesus says, but not the Father. Not the Father. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So what's your faith based upon? He says it's based on an eyewitness account, and the New Testament is that, new witness, is that eyewitness account. It's exactly what the New Testament is meant to be. In the early church, the early believers in, in the first, second centuries that followed Jesus... They said, you know, when there's all, these, there's all these crazy documents floating around that claim to be something about this Jesus. We need to figure out which ones are good and which ones are phonies. Because there were a lot of phony documents going around about Jesus at the time. The Gnostics were really good at that. So they had to pick them out. And you know what their, their number one criteria was? If this is, uh, if this is a, a testimony of an eyewitness we'll accept it. And if we can establish that it is an eyewitness, we'll accept it. So if the, if the beginning of the, of the passage of this thing you look at, it said, this is John speaking, or this is Paul speaking, or this is Peter speaking, and they were prone to say, yeah, let's take that, because we just want the people who saw Jesus, and we'll stick those documents together and use those to make sure we know what's going on. Now, there were a lot of false documents that went around at the time. I've got some of them in my office. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas. Ever heard of that one? 
the, the, a lot of, of anti biblical people love to quote it and say, You're being kept from the Gospel of Thomas. It was, it was left out by the Catholic Church, and they're trying to keep you in the dark. You need to understand the Gospel of Thomas. Well, it's got Thomas's name on it in terms of the title, but all the false ones in the first and second century had someone's famous name on it to try and influence you. So, what they do is they go inside the Gospel of Thomas and they'd read it, which I've done. And if you read the Gospel of Thomas, you'll say, <laughs> You gotta be kidding me. It's, the content itself indicts us of what happens because it's just, it's crazy stuff. And I would encourage you, go read the Gospel of Thomas and the content will convince you as well. <laughs> so, so in the early centuries, they said, we, we just really want to rely on the people who are authentically eyewitnesses to who Jesus was. Yeah, Tito. What about Paul? What about Paul? Paul claimed himself to be an eyewitness of Jesus because of the road to Damascus and because of the almost decade after that where it seems like he and Jesus were in this private tutoring session in Arabia. So he is an eyewitness, Yeah. Interesting. That's a great question, Tito. That's a great question. So anyway, this is, what the, this is what the New Testament is meant to be for us. It's an eyewitness account. So if someone says, how can you believe in the mythology of Christianity? You can say, it's based upon eyewitness accounts of the most astonishing man who ever lived in history. And, and no, one, no one can debate that. You can debate whether they're eyewitness accounts, but a lot of people have run up against that trying to disprove them over the years, and they say, well... I don't know, it looks pretty authentic to me. And you can use a lot of ways to do that. So, so anyway, that's the eyewitness account of who Jesus is. It's based on him. I, I, when, I, when I'm approached by people, and this has happened a number of times, about why I believe in the mythology of religion, <laughs> I say, well, you know what? This isn't, this isn't a cleverly devised tale. One fact of history is true. Jesus came in the first century, and the world changed as a result. How many men do you know that have that kind of effect? And if God himself, let's say, for a debate, if God himself were to come as a man, don't you think he would have that kind of impact on the world? And at that point, people debate and say, well, he was a pretty good guy. No, you don't understand. There was a cultural tidal wave that issued out of Palestine in the first century that didn't stop for centuries and centuries to this very day, a cultural tidal wave has got to be tied back to some public event. And that public event was this man. If he's not the Messiah, I don't know who else qualifies. And so you go back to the fact. And this New Testament gives us eyewitness accounts of the fact of this man. It's all tied back to him. The part B to that discussion, not only did this man exist, and he's the source, admittedly, of this huge cultural tidal wave that covers the world, huge, but he died and raised from the dead. And it was publicly, it was publicly shown that he was, was not in the tomb anymore. Even Josephus, who's not a believer in Jesus, said they buried him, he was dead, and he rose again. So there you go. And he just goes on with the rest of his. So it's a fascinating thing. No one can debate the fact that the tomb was empty. Everything in history says it was empty. And now you're faced with, how can it be empty? And anyway, so we could talk about that for a lot. But my faith right today is based on the physical, un, un, well, physical presence of Jesus in the first century who was an astonishing man or else that cultural tidal wave would have never happened. And so the question that comes up is, who is Jesus? Because that means everything. So that's, that's what I'm saying. They're just eyewitness accounts. Now, Peter goes on. He goes on. Your base, faith can be based on something else. 19, so we have the prophetic word made sure. Ah, before I say that, what he's saying right here is that we have the prophecies. Well, what prophecies is he talking about? Old Testament. Because at the time, the scriptures they had was the Old Testament. And there's prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of the Messiah. So he says, we have those prophecies made even more sure. I mean, sure, we believe them, but you know what? This Messiah that the Old Testament prophecies kept pointing toward? <laughs> he came, and I saw him. Eyewitness. That's what he's saying. Those prophecies came true. I read for you this morning out of Isaiah, and out of that passage in Isaiah 53, Isaiah 53, very clear the entire chapter. This is talking about Jesus, and this is several, it's like 500 years before Jesus comes. Daniel talks about kingdoms that will come and go from the time of Daniel, and, they, and they're spot on. I mean, these prophecies, they, they work. I mean, they, they work so well that people used to criticize the Bible because they said, well, that part of Daniel must have been written way after Jesus because it's just too good of a match until they found Daniel in the Dead Sea Scrolls and had been written two centuries before Jesus. Oh, darn. 
So, so what we're saying is that the prophecies, the prophecies that they were relying on for this Messiah have been made more sure because Peter says, I saw the guy. Here's what Peter did in his second sermon in early Acts. He says, this is his public statement. He says, and now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, that is, in killing Jesus, just as your rulers did also, but the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that is, his Christ, his Messiah, that he would suffer, he has thus fulfilled them. Peter got very bold in, the, in Acts. You know, this is, af, this is after the Pentecost delivery, but he's doing this in front of everybody. This is, after, this is after he and John heal the leper outside the temple, and they bring him in, give him a whole bunch of problems because of that. But he says, listen, th- these prophecies were said beforehand that the Messiah would actually suffer, that he would suffer. And, and they had categorically, the religious establishment at the time, wanted to sort of ignore those. They preferred the word about a Messiah who would reign forever. They're both the same Messiah, but two different comings. So, so he says, listen, he was supposed to suffer, and he fulfilled them. That's what the prophecy said. So there you go. So Peter, even back in early Acts, right, in the same year that Jesus died, he's saying that these prophecies all came true, and these light bulbs went off in his head, and he says, here's the prophetic word made sure, and we saw it. And this was predicted hundreds of years beforehand, and Jesus did it. He did it. He goes on about this prophetic word. 1 Peter 1, we read last year. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, oh, they made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. And it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, the prophets weren't serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. These things into which angels long to look. So Peter here in his first letter says, when the prophets wrote this stuff down through the Holy Spirit, they were dying to know how this was going to work out. I mean, they made serious search. They they were so eager to find out how this was going to work its way out. And then later he says, and you guys got to watch the whole thing unfold. And in fact, it's so incredible, this coming of God in the flesh in Jesus. It's so incredible that even the angels long to look into it more. That's how incredible it is. So Peter's just telling in this second letter, you know, the prophets told about this. They said this was going to happen. The Jews selectively disregarded portions of the Messiah's suffering parts. But hey, hundreds of years before Jesus, it was predicted, and then Jesus came. I was listening to a guy on a podcast a couple weeks ago who uh, he was being asked, do you believe that Jesus is the Messiah? And he said, um, he says, well, I know a lot about Jesus. I know a lot about the prophecies. He says, I don't personally think he was the Messiah. But he says, you know what? I don't think anyone else has ever come close as Jesus has. <laughs> it's a really interesting thing. It's like saying, yeah, he probably was, but I really can't admit it in public. That's what he was saying. And then he went on to say, if Jesus isn't the Messiah, I don't know how anyone else is ever going to qualify. And why? Well, the prophecies are very specific. They, they box in on the timeline of humanity when this Messiah has to come relative to the presence of the temple in Jerusalem and so many other factors. It boxes in the time. It boxes in his, his genealogy, where he comes from, the city that he's born on. How many of you can control what city you're born in? Nobody can control that. All these things together box in is what, it's what theologians like to call the greatest address in history. What is the address of the Messiah? He's got to be in the first century, and he's got to be in Palestine, and he's got all these other things about him. If he's not the Messiah, no one else is going to ever qualify. Won't break his bones. Yeah, we could do a huge list yeah. sometime. It'd be really fun to do. Yeah, it's from Psalms. It won't break his bones. So many, so many things that statistically, uh, uh, I did. I, I read this thing once. If you just took eight of the most prominent prophecies about the suffering Messiah, including the bones not being broken, stuff like that, and where he would be born, the area he would be born, and so on, and just take eight of the almost, it's somewhere the debates go around maybe about two hundred prophecies. Just take the top eight. And you figure out statistically what's the chances of this randomly happening. If someone just randomly got born in Palestine and they randomly just kind of walked around and things happened to them and then they got killed and oh, randomly, the the statistics are so crazy. It's the same as if you covered the state of Texas with silver dollars stacked vertically 
cover the state of Texas with two feet deep of silver dollars for the entire square footage of Texas. And one of those silver dollars was spray painted red. It would be the same as you just kind of going to Texas and reaching in and grabbing the red one for the eight of the more than 100 prophecies. If Jesus isn't that Messiah, he's never coming. And that's the point. That's the prophecies. That's what Peter is saying. And interestingly enough, in this particular case, he's talking about the prophecies predicted of the sufferings of the Messiah. He had to keep hitting that home because the Jews did not want to see about the suffering of the Messiah because that didn't fit the classic idea of the military, mighty, kingly Messiah who would come and you know, put the Romans in their place. Now, there is a day coming when that kingly Messiah will indeed bring justice on a worldwide scale. That's the second coming of Jesus. He'll come as judge. And his kingdom, which started act before eternity, will evidence itself in earth and won't tolerate injustice anymore. Everyone's been kind of given a pass for a while, but when he comes back, the pass is revoked. Judgment comes. Okay, so we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. So not only did you, did you rely on those prophecies before, to help you know, qualify what I was saying about Jesus, you need to even pay more attention to those prophecies. You really need to get into those. And he uses some great, some great allusions to this. Pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. It reminds you of this passage probably, Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Is that redundant? No. Your feet is where you're going to step next. Your path is where you're going. So what he's saying is that your word in this very dark place informs me about the next step I need to take. And it also informs you about the direction I'm going in the end. He says, that's what you need to do with these prophecies. You need to go back and look at those things. Other places, here's one. Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, after he gains his tongue back <laughs> in the passage in Luke 1 before John the Baptist is born, he says, now this is, this is inspired by the Holy Spirit in giving us a view for how heaven sees the birth of Jesus during this time. Luke 1, the sunrise from on high will visit us love that phrase. So you're living in the darkness of night, humanity, and when this Jesus comes, the sunrise from on high will not only shine, but he'll actually come and visit us. It's the light that shines and comes into our very midst. It's the parousia. It's the near being near is what it is. Sunrise. He'll give you an understanding you've been waiting for in the darkness of night of humanity to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. One of my favorite phrases in the entire New Testament, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Your word is a light to my path. It shows my feet where to walk. And this one who's going to be born, this Jesus, is the sunrise from on high that will visit us and shine upon us who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. That's the statement of mankind. That's the statement of us before Jesus, sitting in darkness in the shadow of death, waiting to die. Another place, Revelation 22. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And morning star is is always in the vernacular. It's the first light of the morning. It tells you when the sun's just about to come up, when this morning star comes up. And when you see this morning star, usually Venus in the old kind of traditions of that, when you see this star come up, you knew that the dawning of the sun, the dawning of this light age is just, it's right around the corner. And Jesus says, that's me. I'm the one who's bringing not only the herald of this new age of light, I am the light. I'm the sunrise from on high according to Zacharias. He's, Peter's using all these allusions in here. Here's one last one. For God who said light shall shine out of darkness, that's the creation, visiting the creation, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. We could sit and stare at that verse all morning and not really grab it all. I can come to know who God is through the face of Christ himself. Which is why, when, when one of Jesus' apostles says, show us the Father and that'll be good enough for us. And Jesus says, 
Have I been with you so long you missed it? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's just right here. This is God's promise of wanting to bring us near to him so we can come to know him. And, and the same God who at the beginning of the Bible in Genesis spoke and light happened has now in our hearts spoke and light happened. Isn't that astonishing? So when Peter uses all these illusions up here, it's all of those wound together. You do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. This is where you'll find real understanding of the way things really are that the darkness hides. Until the day dawns, the sunrise from on high shall visit us, and the morning star, Jesus says in Revelation, that's me, arises in the world? No, in your heart. His desire is to arise in our heart, which is why Paul, one of Paul's most favorite phrases is, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this God who wants to shine in the dark place that we find ourselves, which, by the way, is the inevitable darkness of death that was caused by the fall back in Genesis 3, all of us sitting in this dark place anticipating death, he wants us to have life with him and does so by bringing the Messiah as the sunrise from on high that'll visit us, that'll visit me and give me understanding and bring light where there was no light before, it's just darkness. And he will come and be in me and I in him. Who would ever have guessed that the God creator of the universe, that his intention of this creation and of the rescue that he put in place through Jesus was all about bringing me near to him and enjoying him. But that's the consistent message in the entire Bible. In the entire Bible. It's not about trying to do enough good things that somehow at the end of our life we get over some kind of unspoken threshold of goodness, and then if we were over that threshold of goodness, then God gives us some unspoken good thing or status as a result that still is unspoken, but he's not sure what that's going to be. And there's no assurances in that at all. And yet that again, that's part and parcel of most false religions. Do good, do good, do good, and when you die, you'll get good. And that's not this at all. It's not this at all. This is us sitting in darkness in the shadow of death and his sunrise comes into our experience and he redeems us from the shadow of death itself so that he can be in us and we can be in him. And once that transaction's made, you're done. He's given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Everything. It's not a matter of earning it because... He didn't ask a price for it because he gave it. And that's reiterated over and over and over. Isaiah is another really famous place where he says, come to me and buy, buy bread and buy, buy um, drink, but come and buy it from me and it'll cost you nothing. Nothing. Well, then why do you want me to buy it? Because I want you to understand that it's going to cost you nothing. Every, play, every, every other place you go, they're going to ask you to buy it. But for me, these essentials for life, I've designed to give you for free. But you have to come to me and buy it for nothing. And basically, the image in, in Isaiah is you coming to him and coming and saying, well, that, that's what I want and that's what I need, and then turning your pockets out and saying, but you know what? I'm broke. And God says, exactly. You never could buy this. I'm delighted to give it to you. But those who come to that place and say, that's exactly what I need to live, I've got, oh, gosh, I've got like, I've got four, four or five dollars. I think, and I can, I can go out and work this week and make some more, and God's going to shake his head and say, yeah, you just don't get it, do you? It's my delight to give this to you. It's not my delight to have you try and earn it so you can save face and save pride. You can't earn this. You can only receive it as a gift. It's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift. So anytime you read in the New Testament about the grace of God, grace is a gift. Grace is a gift. And if it's not a gift, then it's not grace anymore. <laughs> so anyway, I, we just talked too much on it. But this is what Peter's saying. He's saying, you have this prophetic word. You read it in the Old Testament. You understand about this Messiah who's going to suffer. You need to pay even more attention to that. It'll give you a light in the dark place you find yourself. And this light will actually dawn in your hearts. Wow. That's cool. So, so he goes on, verse 20. But know this, first of all. No prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Now, the Catholic Church for years used to say what that meant was, us peons can't interpret the Bible. 
Got to be, got to be some guy who's you know up there. You know, no prophecy is a matter of one's own interpretation. But that's not at all what it means. It turns out, unfortunately, you have to do a little Greek digging right here. But it turns out what he's saying is that, uh, first of all, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of the original prophet's own interpretation. That's how the grammar works. His, it's his way of saying when the prophets wrote this stuff down, they weren't just making it up. This, this didn't come from them because they thought, well, my name's Isaiah. I think I'm going to write some cool stuff today. What would be really cool for people to read 500 years from now? No! What he got and what he put on paper for Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Hosea and all these guys wasn't something they just made up in their own heads. It was not a matter of their own interpretation. It wasn't their kind of, woo, let's make something up. It's exactly what the Greek is phrased like there. No prophecy was an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit through God. So what he's saying is, I want you to pay more attention to these prophecies, but I want you to also understand that these prophecies are more than just some men writing some goofy stuff on a piece of paper. Exactly. I know, and it's been tested here with Jesus. So, so he's saying, I want you to pay attention to this stuff because what they're putting on paper is from God. It's not their own ideas. Not their own ideas. So when I read for you Isaiah 53 this morning, that wasn't something Isaiah made up. All we like sheep have gone astray. This is the Holy Spirit speaking through Isaiah. All we like sheep have gone astray. Bah! And each of us has gone to his own way. Bah! That's sin, by the way. But the Lord has caused that iniquity of us all to fall on him. The Holy Spirit through the pen of Isaiah. And Peter's saying you can take that to the bank. What these prophets said you can take to the bank is the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Yes, it is. Oh, I love this. If you want to know more about how that process works, I, I was going to include this this morning, but we don't have enough time. Do, if you want to do some homework, look at this. Second, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 through 16. Great, great. It's the epitome passage in all the New Testament about how this process works. So who's speaking, the Holy Spirit or the man? The man or the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit or the man? Well, read this passage. It's really, it's, it's fascinating. It's really, really good. Okay, we need to wrap this up. So what Peter is saying, what's your faith based upon? Well, I've got an eyewitness account, and all the New Testament are those eyewitness accounts. But also, you've got all the Old Testament prophecies. I can say to someone, listen, I can pull some prophecies out of the Old Testament about Jesus that were written clearly, historically proved way before Jesus, and yet they, they fit Jesus. What do you think about that? And usually you'll get in an argument about the history of that claim, but it's, it's very well-founded, it turns out. Very, the more you look into that, then in fact, I've known some famous people who've come out of the secular side of the world and said, I'm going to disprove this right now. I'm going to look into the source of this and show that this is all just mythology. And they went, oh, no. <laughs> There's some historical proof here. So again, the historical basis for your faith, the historical basis for where these words come from, it's, it's there. It's really there. So what's your faith based on? Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, eyewitness accounts of who this Jesus was, and... The fact that he's currently regenerating you right now, which is what he talked about last week. And that actually, that's the trifecta for assurance in the Christian life. I put my trust in following Jesus. Was Jesus a historical person? Eyewitness accounts say yes. Secular history says what he started turned a huge tide of cultural shift that's unexplainable unless you have something of, of equivalent magnitude. And there isn't one at the time. Eyewitness account about who Jesus was. Prophecies from the Old Testament proven to be predated to Jesus that he fulfilled against all odds and with things that he could not control, like where he was born or how he would die. And then in the present, the fact of your constant regeneration. I'm a different person now than when I came to know Jesus in ways that are inexplicable to me. And the most inexplicable ones to me is how my own appetite for sin has declined. I don't get that. <laughs> I don't wish myself into that because those things, <coughs> those things had me by the throat. I would have loved to stay in them. But somehow, the appetites declined. And then somehow my love for who God is and who Jesus is grew. I, I, <coughs> I can't explain that. But regeneration. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting kind of a tickle in my throat here. Um, can you give me water real quick? <coughs> so this is the trifecta of how you can know where you are with the Lord. This is how you can tell whether or not when you put your trust in Jesus, whether it's effective, whether it really went someplace. <coughs> a 
Next week, oh good, I'm closing. Next week, <coughs> thanks Matt. Something just dove into my throat. Next week he dives into false prophets and false teachers. And obviously so. Because if you were listening to what we just looked at, your question is, how do I know when the prophecy I'm looking at is coming from a true prophet? Right? That's a natural follow-on. That's a very obvious question in our culture. How do I know this is a true prophet? How do I know this is a true teacher? If it is, I'll do what you say, Peter. I'll, 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 I'll consider them a lamp in my dark place. But how do we know who's who? So next week, how do we know who's who? Ah, it's really good. But before you get there, if you have doubts about where you are with the Lord, those three things. Jesus was predicted to come in all of history. He came. He did incredible things. The eyewitnesses testified to it. The documents about those eyewitnesses have been well-founded and well-carried over the years. It's very hard to disprove their origins. And now we have this ongoing today, tomorrow, regeneration of my life that's inexplicable for me to explain, except for the fact that he promised that through his spirit, he would regenerate me and make me more like him day after day. And oh my gosh, it happened. One last thing. If you're thinking, I don't know about that regeneration thing, Jim. <clears throat> I think I'm still pretty much the same person I was when I came to know Christ. If you're a pretty new believer time-wise, that's common. That's common. But, but with time, and it doesn't take very long, the Holy Spirit starts to rework you. But one of the messages that Peter says at the beginning last week was, you can, you can partner with this reworking. You can hunger and thirst after righteousness. And say, God, will you rebuild me from the ground up? If your heart's there and you throw open the doors in that sense, he just rushes in and says, hot dog, I've been waiting for this. And he comes in and starts to go. Some of it's painful, but some of it's remarkably miraculous as well. I, we have people here who can tell you about transformations that started the day, the day they knew Christ. And some transformations, which, <laughs> doggone it, are still going on. <laughs> And I think that's partly at the, at the base of Paul's comment about, you know, when, God, why won't you take this away? When are you going to change this? And God says, oh, my grace is sufficient. Just hang in there. you get there. But as you walk in Christ and as you mature in Christ, you find him giving you an appetite for godliness and righteousness because that's the description of who he is, and we've fallen in love with him. And because of that, he starts to replicate that in our lives for the purpose that people can see our grapes and go, how did you get those grapes? And we can say... Jesus, that's not me. That's not me. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. It just thrills my heart every time we take a look. Lord, we pray you'd continue to work out in us that kind of godliness. We know that our salvation doesn't depend on that. You've already given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. But Lord, we want to know you more. And in that reworking of us, bit by bit, we come to know you more and come to fall in love with aspects of you we never even knew were there. And then we yearn for them in our lives as well. God, you are so good to us. You remake us. You fashion us into your bride so that at the end of all time, you've made us ready to be united with the bridegroom. And Lord, day by day as you're transforming us, um, who you are starts to reflect in us, Christ in us. And Lord, it's a remarkable thing to be able to answer those who see those fruits in our life and who marvel at those fruits in our life uh, when we say, you know, it's not me. I didn't do this. All the glory goes to God. He's remade me. He accepted me when I was in the darkest and worst, worst place, so unworthy in every respect. And he's remaking me. Isn't it wonderful? So Lord, we thank you for your great loving kindness in your life. We pray that you would hasten the day of your return and that you would hasten the speed of our transformation into, uh, into your nature, into your godliness. So we thank you for all that you've given to us pertaining to life and to godliness. And our hearts are content as you reside in us and make us new. So thank you for all this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.